ants is good. Remember, you're going to be getting into those roses and they are very um, prickly. So, okay. Why do we prune roses? Well, you may recall, if you look at all your other blooming shrubs, they usually have a bloom season and they bloom at that season and they don't bloom anymore for that year. With roses, the original old roses, the heritage roses as we call them now, were the same way, but they were hybridized to make um, repeat blooming roses. So you are gonna prune them to, um, to stimulate new bloom. Um, and you have to know before you start pruning, if you have an antique rose or a heritage rose, and we used to call them old roses, that, but people would get confused and think, well, if it's 20 years old, it's an old rose. No, not necessarily. If it's not a modern hybrid, if it's an old rose, and if you know it for sure, it's an old rose, it's only gonna bloom once in the late spring, and then it won't bloom again till next year. So you do not prune it now. Um, you would prune it when you need to prune it, which you still need to prune them, but you would prune it immediately after its bloom. If you prune it now, um, what, what the old roses do is they put on their new growth right after bloom and then they set their buds um, on that new growth. And if you prune it now, you just cut off all this season's bloom. So you need to understand what kind of a rose you have. But the modern roses, repeat blooming roses, you prune them in the winter, dormant pruning. So the purpose um, is, to, um, is to remove dead and diseased wood to open up the center of the, of the plant for good air circulation, uh, to promote new wood for new bloom. Again, every time you prune the rose, you're gonna stimulate it to put on more growth and more bloom and to maintain a good form. Um, by that, I mean, you want your rose to be opened up so you get plenty of air circulation to help um, keep down the funguses and diseases that, um, that you're gonna get in the rose. Um, the timing, what we say is six weeks before your last anticipated frost date. Now we don't know, of course, when our last frost date is gonna be, but your local farm advisor will tell you what the date is for your area. Now here in El Dorado County, we have many microclimates. So we use Placerville, which is our county seat for our center. And that's at 800 feet above sea level. And our last anticipated frost, frost date there, we call April the 15th. So you take that number as your base number. And if you're a thou every thousand foot higher, you add a week, every thousand foot lower, you can take a week off to figure out your own date. So we're going to prune six weeks before that date. So you get that date first and then you can count back your six weeks. Now you can fudge it a little bit. If you're in a colder area and you get cold frosts, you may wanna go a little later. And the reason why we do this is because roses don't stay reliably dormant in our Mediterranean climate if we get a warm spell in the early spring, which we often do. And they, um, when you remember when you're dormant pruning, as soon as the weather warms up, it's going to stimulate that rose to start growing. And if you prune too early um, and you get um, a warm up in say the 1st of March and everything starts to grow and then we get a cold frost, it's going to kill all your new growth. And the new growth, of course, is much more tender than the old growth, so it can't stand up to frost very well. So you don't want to prune too soon. If you live in an area that has no frost, and I don't know where you're all coming from, so I don't know if we have any areas with, uh, without a frost. Um, the way to get your rose to go dormant is to not take off the last bloom. And we do that in our demonstration garden as well. When you leave, if you remember, all plants are the same as animals. The, um, the whole purpose of the plant is to reproduce. So every time you prune the rose, you're stimulating new growth because you're taking off its seed ability. If, if it's gone to a hip, a rose hip, you cut that off, it's going to start um, growing again. So um, you, uh, you, you just want to make sure that you don't prune too soon and stimulate it into that new growth. Uh, and if and if you have no frost date, and what we do in the garden here is we don't we don't prune off the last bloom in the fall. We lay, leave it alone. And I know it looks ugly. And if they're in your front yard and your neighbors are upset with you, too bad, because it's going to help that bush go dormant. It's not going to be stimulated when the cold weather comes. So you leave that bloom on, 
and it gets cut off when you do your dormant pruning. And in our, our rose garden at our demonstration garden, if you go in there now, they look awful because they've all got dead blossoms on the top of the, of the shrubs and we do that on purpose. So that's the reason why. And again, if you don't get a frost, leave that last bloom on to help your rose slow down and stop growing so that um, it doesn't grow through the winter time. Okay. Um, now we're going to tell you, I, I've, I figured out a way to make it so it's not so confusing. I remember when I first had roses and believe it or not, English people do not grow up learning to grow roses. Um, I grew up in London. I never had a garden and I knew nothing about growing roses. So um, this did not come with, with my genes, okay? But anyway, I, the first time I looked at a rose that was overgrown, I thought, oh my Lord, what am I gonna do with this thing? You know, it's a mess. So I figured out a procedure that you can use that means that you don't have to make any decisions until the last part. You don't have to make a decision over which one goes and which one stays until the last part. So the first thing you do is you shorten the top growth. You're going to take the rose down at least a third to a half of last year's growth. Now in England, they cut them down to about a foot and a half every year, but every place is different. And pruning roses is as much an art as it is a science and everybody does it differently. So this is my system that I use to make it easier for people not to be confused. So the first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna take these big shears. And you're gonna whack off the top of the clip. This is gonna go anyway. And particularly now this year, I've still got a lot of leaves left on my roses and some of them are still blooming actually. But, um, and I live in Cameron Park, so I'm at 1,350 feet. Um, you're gonna cut that top off because it's gonna go anyway. And once you've got the top off, you can see easier, much more easily um, what the mess is in the inside. So you take the top off and hopefully that gets rid of most of the leaves that are still on the plant. Then you're gonna take a look at, um, dead or diseased canes. And they're pretty easy to see. If you know anything about your roses at all, you'll know what doesn't look like a healthy cane. Cut it out. No decision, right? It's diseased or it's dead, you cut it out. Crossing canes. If they're crossing through into the cane, into each other, one of them's gotta go. So you have to decide which one's gonna go. But if they're both going onto the inside, you want them both out. Because the idea is you're gonna open up the cane, open up the shrub. So take them both out. And the reason why you don't want crossing canes is because they've got prickles. And that prickle, as they rub against each other in the breeze, it's going to damage the cane and give it more access because of the damage to insects and diseases. So you take them out. Um, and weak canes, by weak, I mean, if they're thin um, and they don't look very, very vigorous, you're going to take them out. And you, because when you finally have the canes you're going to leave, you're not going to keep anything that's thinner than a pencil, unless it's a miniature rose. Obviously, you've got to take into consideration what kind of a rose it is. If you've got a little tiny bush with little tiny blossoms, then you're going to, you're going to have thinner canes. So it's, it's all, a, it, it, you have to look at the, at, the, um, at, the, at the shrub and what kind of shrub you have. Um, then you're going to remove any rootstock. Now that, those are canes that are coming out from below the crown, assuming that you have a grafted rose. If you have a rose that's growing on its own roots, which has become popular again, then all of the canes are for that particular variety. But if it is a grafted rose, which a lot of them are, particularly if you've had them in your, your yard for a few years, anything that's growing out from below that graft, which is that big chunky lump that you can see at the bottom where everything's coming out, anything below that is rootstock and you want to cut that out. Now, I've been around roses long enough that I can tell rootstock from 20 feet away. And in a rose garden, and they will continue to grow all year, so you're constantly going to be cutting them out. And you will, once you get to know your roses, you'll be able to recognize rootstock from a long way away. They tend to be very tall. The leaves are a different color. Um, they only bloom occasionally, and when they do bloom, it's a red bloom. So if somebody tells you they've got a bicolored rose because half of it's yellow and the other half of it's red, well, the red is the rootstock. And the rootstock is usually Dr. Huey, which is a very vigorous rootstock that is common here. And it has a red single blossom. So um, cut out your rootstock. And then you're gonna um, decide which canes you've got left that you're gonna keep. 
Now, depending on how vigorous the rose is, you might want to keep up to six or seven canes, or you might be down to two or three, and that's fine. Hopefully, you're not down to one, because you've got a very sick rose if you're only down to one cane. But um, you're going to pick the remaining canes, and you're going to shorten them to the desired height, which is you know a half to, to, to a third to a half of your last year's growth. And I show you here, you will see in the video, you will see me looking at the remaining canes that I'm cutting. And the reason I'm looking at them is because I want to find the bud that I'm going to cut to. And I'm hoping, let's see if I can show you here. This is the bud here. This is a bud from new growth that's going to come out this way. If you can't see the bud, let me see if I can get this close enough to the screen. Um, there's a leaf scar right below the bud. There is, let me see if I can get it up here close enough. There it is. See the leaf scar there, that little yellow thing there? That's where there was a leaf. And there is always a bud immediately above that leaf scar. And you can see, you know, the bud is right there. So you're going to cut the end of the cane and you're going to go to a bud that bud is going each bud is going to go the way that the bud is pointing so this bud is going to go out this way and so you cut to the bud in the direction that you want the cane the new cane to grow so if this is growing up the center and you want the growth to go that way you cut it to this this bud here and you can see how i've cut the how i've cut it on a slope slightly above the bud with the high point of the 45 degree angle above the bud. Do not cut it too tight, too, too oblique, because if you do, you don't want to go in and take the cane away from behind the bud. But that is that is the final cut that you make. Okay. And then the last thing you do after you've shortened all your healthy canes and you've got this, this lovely plant and hopefully it's a vase shape or a vase, as you say, in your country, a vase where I come from, um, then you're going to rake out all of the dead leaves from, and, and pick off any old leaves that are still on the plant. Now, if you've got new leaves because the pruning is late or your roses are starting to bud out, which some of mine are doing now, um, you leave those on the cane. Any old leaves you take off and then you rake out with a little bit of a bitty bitty rake, Remember, you've got your head in that row, so you're going to rake out as much of it as you can. And you may have to, that's why you wear these long gloves, because you're going to get in there amongst the canes and clean out the dead leaves. And rake them all up and do not put them in your compost pile. Um, the disease is um, over winter on the canes, the spores of the funguses, and they splash back up. Um, onto the canes, which is why you're raking the leaves away. And they also are not easily destroyed in the compost pile. So um, at the garden where we have over 100 roses, I think, I don't know how many we have now because we lost a number. Um, the one thing that we, we do not compost is any of our rose trimmings. And that's including during the, the, the in season pruning as well as the dormant season pruning. So we, we, we remove them all. Um, now, that is that is the way to prune bush roses. Climbing roses are a little bit different. Climbing roses, the first two years you don't prune at all. And there are two kinds of climbing roses. There are roses called pillar roses, that's P-I-L-L-A-R, which is like a pillar. And then there are true climbers. Now, they're not really true, they're not really climbers. Roses don't have anything to hang on to, so they're not really climbers, they're just very long canes. What we call a true climber has a bud at the end of the cane that is called an apical, apical bud. And what that does, um, if you let your canes grow straight up and you're going to let them grow for the first two years, you're not going to prune them at all. You're just going to tie them whatever, whatever way you want to tie them. If, if it has that apical dominance, which means that bud at the top, so long as it's pointing upwards, will stop any other buds down the cane from growing blossoms. So you want to break that apical dominance by bending that cane. Now, there's lots of ways you can do it. If you have them on an arch or you have them along a fence, you just tie them to it. If you want to make a fountain of a rose in the middle of the yard, 
you take a rock and you tie a piece of string on it and you tie the other piece of string to the cane and you bend it. Once that dominance is gone, it will send out side branches all the way along the cane. And those are the branches that will bloom. If you have a pillar rose, you don't have that apical dominance. So you don't need to worry about that so much, but they're not gonna put on the blue, the bloom canes, the, the little side canes until the second year, which is why you don't prune them right away. So you wanna develop those side canes. And those are the ones that you prune in the winter, um, the dominant pruning, and you prune them the canes can grow quite long. You prune them back to two buds. So when the when the, the climbing rose, and you'll see one, I did one cane in the in the video that we're going to show you. Um, they look pretty ugly in the winter because you've got these big long sticks out there with all kinds of little things sticking off of them. And if you've got too many too many side canes, they're too crowded. You can take some out altogether so you can thin it out. But that is the way you treat um, a, a climbing rose. And you don't cut the main cane at all unless you want to replace old canes with new canes, which you can do too. They're a little bit hard to deal with because they are so long and they're all wound up together once they're all tied in. But, um, but you will need over time to replace um, old canes with new canes. And you will get new canes that grow up every year. So if you don't replace them, you're going to have to thin it out somehow. Otherwise, you're going to have a real, you're going to look like a blackberry bush on your hand. So. You have to keep them thinned out. Um, so, so then you still you still look at dead canes and, and diseased canes, um, and then you cut those lateral shoots, those lateral shoots to two buds. Um, I hope I've made that understandable. You can see a picture when we do the video, so you'll understand what I mean. Ground cover roses um, are kind of a new thing. Um, again, they tell you they're easy care. Um, there's no such thing as an easy care rose. Um, there are some that don't have any, any prickles, which does make it easier, but th there's no such thing as an easy care rose. You still got to cut out dead canes because a ground cover rose is going to grow in a mass from the center and, and go out. But as it gets crowded and as more canes grow up through the center, the ones underneath are going to die from lack of light. So you're going to have to remove them anyway. Otherwise, it's just going to look awful. You can have a lot of black dead stuff. So you're going to have to cut out those dead canes, uh, thin any remaining canes if necessary, if they're growing straight up or, or they're growing in the wrong way or there's too many of them, just thin them out. Um, and then you, if you want to make the ground cover rows more bushy, you just cut them back like you would a shrub rose. And then you clean up the dead leaves. Uh, miniature roses don't think because they're miniatures they don't need pruning. They're very vigorous growers because they, and they, they send out a lot of canes, so they need to be pruned just as heavily as a hybrid tea or a, a grandiflora is. Um, the last thing you'll do, uh, what we do at the demonstration garden, is we, we spray, and it's the only time of the year that we spray the roses. And what we're doing is we're trying to get a start on the bugs and diseases that are going to hit us in the spring. Um, and so we use, a, at least I use, a combination. This is horticultural oil. This is, um, this is OMRI um, listed. It's mineral oil. And that what that does is it suffocates any overwintering eggs that are on the rows, on the canes. Um, and I mix it usually with liquid cop, which is just a brand, it's just a liquid copper, and that will kill um, the spores of the 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 um, the, the, the um, powdery mildew and the black spot that we get on roses in the summertime, and downy mildew and some of the other ones that we don't get in our area, but you might get in yours. These two can be mixed together. Now, normally you don't mix chemicals; you have to be very careful. But these can be mixed together. If you're using liquid carp, it does not, um, it doesn't stay suspended easily in water. And of course you, you read all the directions on the back, you wear all the equipment that you're supposed to wear. This is the last thing you do after you've pruned the rose and got rid of all the leaves, then you spray. And hopefully you've got a good day. You need at least two or three days with no rain to spray. Um, so when you've got, when you're using liquid carp, you have to keep it suspended in your sprayer. 
And um, I used to be the laughing stock of the neighborhood because they would see me with a back, backpack sprayer and about every few, few minutes I, I'd be doing a dance, you know, with my backpack sprayer bouncing up and down like this. And that was to keep the copper suspended in the water. Uh, and the oil stays suspended pretty good, but the two together is what we use. So um, we don't spray during the growing season. If we have black spot, we pick it off. Um, if it's not too bad, we leave it alone. If we have uh, mildew, we use a strong um, shoot shot of water. Mildew is the, uh, the only fungus that I know of that needs dry leaves to grow. So if you can wash off your roses, um, you can keep the, the mildew and, uh, uh, at bay. And it's only early season, usually. Mildew is only early season and very late season. Um, if you've got insects, wash them off, pick them off, do whatever you want. But we don't use any sprays during the, se during the growing season. Um, there is an alternative to the copper and oil. Um, instead of the copper, you could use a lime sulfur, which is another, um, another dormant spray. Um, and then there is neem oil which comes from the neem tree that the in, uh, from India, which has been used by the Indians for, uh, for insect control and, and, uh, and uh, fungus control for hundreds of years. Um, and we did use this for a while in the demonstration garden, but, um, and we did, I did a test the first year to see which looked like it was best. And, and we went to neem oil only um, for two or three years. And then we had a really bad disease hit our roses and we lost about 23 roses. And I just felt that the neem is not strong enough. So I went back to the copper and oil. Um, and then there's one thing, this is my nemesis guys. If you have this stuff, get rid of it and don't buy it. You can't see it here because it's back to front. At least I can't see it's back to front to me. That says systemic. A systemic, so it has a systemic pesticide in it along with a, with a food. And they have this big deal, you know, feed every six weeks, which you don't need to do anyway, but that's another class. But um, a systemic insecticide means it will kill everything that is on the plant through the roots because this set systemic makes the plant poisonous. Not just what's sprayed on, it goes down through the roots and all the leaves become poisoned. Well, if you've got aphids and you've got a good population of ladybugs, you spray that stuff on, you just killed your ladybugs. You killed your lace wings. You totally screw up your, your whole ecology around your roses. So don't use it on any plants. Don't use anything systemic. If you're using anything during the growing season, if you think you need to, um, first thing to do is identify what your pest is and make sure that you only deal with the pest and use the least thing, a liquid soap or something, you know, um, since an, an insecticidal soap or something to get rid of it. But the easiest thing is water. And you go pick them. Stop getting squeamish about squish, squishing bugs, bugs because, you know, if you love your roses, you want to keep them nice. So um, I think I've talked about all of that. There was only one th other thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, this is bare root season. Um, if they still sell, well, if you're buying from an, a, an online nursery, you're going to get bare roots. And I think mine are going to be delivered either today or tomorrow. Um, so literally, they will come bare root. And I have um, one little thing that I just do not like. Um, in the big box stores, you will see bare root roses in a plastic wrap. And if you are going to buy one of those, the only time you buy them is you find out when the truck is arriving to deliver them and you buy them right off the back of the truck. Because what happens, they're wrapped in plastic and a lot of times they're set outside and those roots have got a little bit of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a little bit of moss around them to keep them wet. So they're in plastic and they sit outside and they get into the sun and they get heated up and the roots cook. And that's why you see so many of them are already budding out. And so that is not, not a good plant to buy. If you, you're going to keep your roses for 20 or 30 years at least, you want to start off with a good rose. So you want to start off, the, and roses are graded, you want a number one. And if it's a good, if it's a good maker, that the grade will be on the rose. And I won't go into a big deal about what the grade means, but it, a number one is what you want. So if you're going to buy um, a bare root rose, 
you dig your hole and you dig it deep enough so that the crown, which is where the, the buds, the growth is starting from, the, the graft is at the soil level. Or if you're in a very high frost area, high freeze area, you can have it below the soil level. Or you can have it a couple of inches above the soil level if you're going to mulch, but you don't want mulch coming right up to the edge of the rows anyway. But so about ground level. So you dig your hole and you, you put your shovel across the top to make sure it's the, deep enough. And um, you can put a little phosphorus in the soil if you want to, if you think your soil is, is lacking in phosphorus, because that is the uh, one of the um, main nutrients that roses need that is not water soluble, so you can't get it on from the top. Um, and then you build, well, if you don't know about your soil, dig the hole and pour some water in it. If the water stays in for more than four or five hours, go find another place because roses don't like wet feet in the winter time and you don't want soggy, soggy soil because they will just die. So um, it needs to be well drained. Um, we don't recommend amending the soil. You wanna use your native soil. So after you've dug your hole and you've put the water in and it drains fine within a, a few hours, you know, five or six hours if it drains, that's good enough. And you're gonna go back and you're going to make a little pyramid in the middle of your, of your hole. And when you pull your rows, meanwhile, you've got your rows pre-soaking in a bucket of water. It should soak for 24 hours because it's been dehydrated in shipping. So you want to plug those roots up and the canes up too. Um, and you're going to spread the roots around that little pyramid. And then you're going to put some soil in it. About halfway up the hole, tamp it gently, soak it again, and then fill it up to the crown and tamp it down gently. Do not stomp on the roots. You don't like people stomping on your feet. Just, just gently tamp, tamp it down and then soak it again. And then check to make sure that the rose hasn't sunk in the hole. But the whole reason for the pyramid is to make sure that it stays up at the right place. Because you don't want the situation where the rose is in a dip and rain is going to constantly feed into that dip. You want it level with the soil or even a little higher than the, the, the surrounding soil. And then you soak it again and that's it. Um, if the rose has not been pruned properly, you might want to go in and make sure you've pruned it to a bud where you want the growth to go. Uh, if, the ro if any of the roots are broken, you cut them, you cut them above the break. But other than that, it's pretty easy to do. And then just sit back and wait. Okay, I talked you through it now and I think we're gonna to go to the clip, the, the clip of me actually pruning a rose. Um, if Ruth can do that or Tracy can do that, we'll do that next. Grandiflora rose called Solitude and because it's a grandiflora, it's a lot taller than most hybrid teas are. And the purpose of pruning here is we're gonna cut it down um, a third to a half of last year's growth. So we will start using my method by taking the top off. And the purpose of doing this is usually if you've got more leaves, it's much easier to see what's inside when all the stuff is taken off the top. And since you're gonna be cutting this off anyway, take it off ahead of time. See, we have some new growth on here already and it's all coming off. And I don't know whether you noticed, but you can see some dead blooms on here. Um, if you allow the last bloom to go to seed or basically go to hips, you will help your rose go dormant. Um, and particularly if you live in an area that doesn't have frost, remember the plant's purpose is to set seed. And if you keep cutting the top off, it doesn't have a chance. So if you leave the top on for the last bloom, then it will help it go dormant. Okay, we've taken the top off. The next part we do with this rose is we're gonna take out any dead or diseased canes. Um, if they're little, little ones, we'll take them all out later, but there's, uh, I don't see any dead ones here. Let's take a look over here. No dead ones, but I'm gonna start taking out crossing wood and wood that I know needs to be removed. Like if you have old woody canes and you've got younger canes, 
you save the younger canes and take out the older canes. They're very sharp. This cane here is old and it's not growing very strong branches. So it's kind of done its thing and I'm gonna take it out right down here at the bottom. Because we're in a rose garden that the roses are very close together, we tend to prune our roses more horizontal than, um, than um, the way you normally would. So I'm taking this one out too. Because I'm going to save this one. Um, now I'm going to take out um, anything that's crossing. Remember when you're pruning roses, if you're not sure, you can always leave it and come back later. Once you cut it off, you can't glue it back on. So, we're opening this rose up. Okay, so you can see I've already take out, taken out a lot. So now I'm gonna go to thinning the crossing branches which I can use a smaller clipper for. And remember with your smaller clippers, remember the science, the longer the handle, the more leverage you have. So we have a crossing cane here, I'm taking it out. Now it's possible that I'll come back later and maybe remove a whole piece that I've taking the canes out. But this is the area where you don't make any decisions yet. So we're trying to make it as simple as possible. So if it's dead, disease, crossing canes, take them out. No decision necessary. This one's crossing. The reason why you don't want the canes to be crossing because they are thorny and if they scratch one another you're likely to get an entrance for disease and insects. And the idea is to, to um, open up the plant so that it doesn't get so thick and it gets good air circulation. You take off anything that's less than a quarter, a quarter to a half inch thick. The science tells you, if you think of the structure of a tree or a, or a shrub, a woody shrub, this rose is going to bloom on the new wood that grows from the cuts that we make. So every, every branch that comes out of a branch is going to be smaller than the one that it's on and you will get to where the branches are so thin that they can't take the weight of the rose blossom. Of course, that's not what you want. So we're going to... Let's see. This one here. And what you can do, if you're not so sure, is you can do one section of the rose at a time, kind of divide it up into quarters finish one quarter and then go back and finish the next one and then the next one and then you might make some final decisions which may take out some of those canes but right now we're not dealing with that so all these little thin canes all come out you cut them as close to the branch as you can don't leave a stub but remember about the branch bark collar this uh, relates to roses too they have that little area where they meet the cane where is where the healing um, mechanism is the closing mechanism is not really healing but closing. Here's another crossing cane. Okay. This one is a nice strong cane 
but I don't like the growth at the top. So I'll cut it back in a minute and we can see if we can get some stronger growth coming lower on the branch this year. Meanwhile, we're going to take out this one because it's crossing that one. We take out the ones that are going into the shrub. We don't want uh, the growth going in. We want it going out as much as possible, recognizing that, as I said here, because we have the roses so close together, we tend to have them more vertical than you normally would with just a rose in the garden. The idea is to end up with as much of a, a vase shape as you can get, to get lots of light through, nice and thin. Actually, when you look at this one here, is this is a particular, this is what I mean by, this is an old cane, it's worn out. You see how thin this new growth is? And obviously we tried to rejuvenate it last year and it didn't work. So we're gonna take that whole one out because this, this growth is way too thin and these are pretty hefty blossoms. So I'm gonna take it out. There's nothing worse than a sticky tool. Just open and close it. close to finishing this side of the cane, this cane here, and we're going to cut to an outside bud, and there's a bud right there, we cut at a 45 degree angle with the high point of the eye angle above the bud, and you don't cut the angle so deep that it cuts into the cane behind the bud, so you've got to be a little bit above the bud to avoid that. Space here, I'm going to save this one. I well, no, it's kind of thin. I will. I have to find a bud in the direction I want to the growth to go. Remember, the, the the bud, the direction of the bud dictates where the growth is going to come. like this because they're a pain you have plenty of space between them which also means that they're less less likely to get diseases or they won't catch into each other there's a nice bud here we're going to that bud we don't want this one here or this one here because they're going to grow out into these i'm going to leave this cane for one more year and if i think it looks like it's going to Cross too badly, I'm going to come back and cut it off later. Right now, I'm going to leave it. I do not need this anymore. This one. I'm having the bud come out here because I've got a hole. Ideal is that you you end up with four, three to four, three to five um, canes, all uh, going out perfectly, so that you have a lovely vase shape. But frankly, you have to deal with what you've got, and it's very rare that you have that perfect alignment. cane here 
which is probably a borer. I'm going to down a little further. Still a borer. And it will either, it may not be alive, it may be an old wound. It's a possibility that will. Now this one I'm taking down to here. It will um, continue to grow into the plant and it will kill that cane. But we will wait and see. Okay, got two more left. This one is a good cane. This top here is dead from a cut made last year, but it's live wood below it. Take that one off. It's too small. one here to see if we can get a little better one than we got here last year. Take this one off because it's too close. Right here. I've got one left. And I'm not really happy with any of the growth that came off of this because it's not very, very heavy, uh, very thick. So I'm going to try cutting it further down the cane. We've got a bud here and see what we get this year. Okay. This one has a post, the name is coming up the middle, so we wouldn't normally have that kind of obstruction. Okay, now I've got anything small I've got coming out of here. We cut all of that small stuff off. Down as if you've got a a lot of growth you just have to do the best you can try not to leave big stubs the reason why i'm leaving more canes on this is it's a very robust plant it blooms profusely it's fabulous blooms um, and it's very healthy so i'm going to see if we can keep all of these canes i think we can if not i can always remove one later but for now i'm going to keep them so we finished no we haven't quite finished i don't like that one So um, pruning a rose doesn't have to be a one day thing. Um, a lot of times I'll prune a rose and I'll come back the next day and say to myself, why the heck did I leave that piece on? So then I can come back and, and tidy it up a little bit more or even take it down a lot more and take out some cane. So you don't have to make the final decision in one go through. Now here where we have so many roses, it's kind of got, get it done and go because we've got a lot to do. But when you only have a few, you can take your time and decide. But okay, so the, sim the, the, the interesting thing was, I made it simple, I cut off the top, cut out anything dead and diseased, cut out any crossing canes, cut out anything that's too small, and then you work with what's left over. And the last thing you do is you clean up, should I bring it with me? Yes. You clean up all of the leaves, and you notice now that I've finished cutting, there are no leaves left on the plant. And if there are old leaves, you take them off. If, you, if you're late pruning and uh, you've got new growth coming out, do not take off the new growth, unless you're cutting it out, of course, because it's in the wrong place. But um, you take off the old leaves. Remember that roses are very susceptible to uh, funguses, and the spores of those funguses are on these leaves, and the rain splashes it right back up onto the plant. So we remove them all from around it. And this is why you wear these gloves, because when we're going in there and taking them out. Because there are places where you can't get anywhere in there except with your hands. So you wear protective, protective gloves like these. These happen to be goat skin palms um, with um, hide, you know, cow hide arms. But uh, the goat skin is very good because it's very dense and most of the thorns can't get through it. Whereas cowhide is much more open textured and so it can get through. So eventually these will all be picked up and taken away. And you do not compost them because of the fungus that's lying on the leaves over the winter. And we will, when we finish with this bed, we will rake it all out and take out all the leaves. Um, and uh, we will do only one spray in this garden and we will do it when, the gar when, when one section is completely um, pruned, we will come in and we will spray with a solution 
a combination of a fungicide like Magicop and uh, an oil, horticultural oil. Uh, the fungicide is to get the spores that are left, there will be spores left on the, on the canes from last year, and the oil will uh, smother the, the uh, eggs of any overwintering insects. And during the growing season, we will not spray it here at all. If we get some mildew or some black spot, we'll just pick it off, but we don't spray. So the only time we do spray is once when it's dormant. And I think that's it for now. In rows, you do not prune it at all for the first two years. You're gonna get the main canes to grow and you want them to grow as sturdily as possible and tie them or whatever you're going to do. And I will talk um, later on about apical dominance. We don't need to talk about that now. But what happens was, is when the rose is growing, if it has apical dominance, it'll only bloom right at the top. So that's why you have to work it over. But actually you can see that the blooming part of the rose is on these side shoots. So what you do, you don't prune the main cane at all, you prune the side shoots and take the ones out that are too thin, like that one. You, you prune them heavily, you prune them back to two buds. And so they look terrible and they're bare. And if the stems are too close together, so they, they, it looks like a stick with a bunch of little stubs on it. pulling this down just to show you. Normally I would be on a ladder and I would put it all in place. And you need to recognize that rose bushes are not actually climbers. They've got nothing to climb with. They have to be tied up. They're just really tall roses with a special method of growing. So that's going to get tied back up. But you can see it's just stubs all the way down. And unfortunately, last year, normally when we do our dormant pruning, the last thing that gets pruned are the climbers. So we had the garden pruned last year and we got shut down before we could prune, prune the climbers. So these climbers were in bad shape because they didn't get winter pruned last year. So they're gonna get a heavy pruning this year, assuming that we don't get shut down again and the weather cooperates. But that is how the stem of a climber should look. Okay, so you let it grow for at least a couple of years so that it gets tall and, um, and the, the second year it's growing it'll start to put out these side shoots assuming that it, it uh, you've controlled the apical dominance which I will talk about later, uh, another part of the class um, it will start sending out these side shoots and those are the ones that will so unless you need to rejuvenate the canes you do not cut the top of the cane off you only cut off the side shoots of the blue Okay, Eve, you're back on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, we've gone through the main part. Um, um, we're ready for questions now. Okay, great. I love that video and I loved your talk. So we have a few questions. Okay. For the spray of the horticulture oil and liquid cop, do you follow the directions on each and then just add the amounts together? Yes, and usually what you do, don't make the mistake of putting the, um, uh, the chemical in first and then adding the water because you'll get froth and then you won't be able to see where your levels are properly. So what you wanna do is you wanna fill your container up almost full <clears throat> to, the, to the, you know, with the gallon or whatever it is you're gonna need um, and then put your chemicals in and then just top it off just a little bit so that you could um, so it's got plenty of water to displace in, but you don't get a, a bunch of froth that you, you know, that, that's very difficult for you to tell if you filled it up properly or not. And then once you've got it filled up and you've closed it off, then shake it well to make sure that it's well distributed. And then as I say, if you're using copper, 
you need to shake it um, quite often to keep it uh, suspended in the, in the solution. And if you're wearing a backpack, don't care what the neighbors think, they think you're crazy dancing around with something on your back, but that's what you're doing. Because it's a lot easier, if you've got three gallons on your back, you're not gonna wanna take it off and, and shake it around. At least I'm not. Um, so it's gonna stay on my back until it's empty. So, so that's how you use it, okay? Next question. Next question is, I have a climbing rose that I put in two years ago in too sunny of a spot, south facing against a wood wall. And the mature canes have been sunburned and are dark brown. Should I just cut the dark brown canes out and hope that the one or two inner green canes will thrive? Also, should I paint the outside canes to, the, to protect them against the sun? We don't normally recommend painting roses and I need to tell you that the canes will darken as they age. Uh, the first, the, when the canes come out, they're young. When they're young, they're green, but they don't stay green. They stay, they get hard and brown and woody. So it, they're not necessarily burnt unless they've got signs of burn on them, black on them. I doubt that they're sunburned. Um, roses should be grown in full sun. So, um, if you're growing it against a white wall on the west side of your house, it's probably not the best. You should be growing green peppers there. But, um, but normally we don't have a problem with sunburn on roses. Okay, uh, another question is, I have a lot of borer damage holes down into the canes. Yeah. Should I treat the cut canes after pruning with something like tree seal to keep borers, borers from settling in? Never use tree seal. Tree seal shrinks and, 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 and cracks. And then you've got a prime place for um, insects and other things to hide. So you don't use tree seal. If you've got tree seal, take it down to the, to the waste place and throw it away. You don't use tree seal on roses. You don't use it on trees. Um, I, when I first joined Master Gardeners many years ago, uh, the gentleman that was the rose person at those times, the thing was to use thumbtacks in any rose cane that was wider than a quarter inch. So when he did the first winter pruning, it was at his house and I went then. I was very new master gardener at the time and didn't have a lot of experience with roses. And he had rose bushes that must have had a hundred thumbtacks in them because every place he had a, a cane, he put a thumbtack in the top and that was to stop a borer getting in. Now borers won't get into thin canes, but they will get into the wider canes. Um, then the idea was, well, you put some Elmer's glue on there. Well, if you've ever seen the horn on the back end of a raspberry horn tail, he's gonna go right through that, that, uh, that glue. So right now I do nothing. I don't do anything. We do not do anything to try and stop the borers. Um, try and keep your canes healthy, keep them growing vigorously. And if you've got borers, um, if you're lucky, they were, they've hatched from last year and you don't have another borer there. If you have a borer, you can keep, if you've got plenty of room in the cane, you can keep cutting down until you get good wood that's got no, no bore damage in it. Um, and, it. and if you can't do that, then just take the cane out if it's a really a problem cane, but we don't use any treatment for borers. Okay, another question is, where did you obtain those great gloves? <laughs> Actually, um, you can now buy them. The first pair I bought, like I say, they were 20 years old when I finally got rid of them. I had to buy those through one of the, the, the garden catalogs. But I found these at, um, at one of the local nurseries this time. And actually, they were half off on sale. So I always love something that's on sale. So, um, But they used to be like $25 a pair. I mean, they were not cheap. Well, and I'm really stingy. So, you know, I kept them so they looked so ugly by the time I threw them away. You wouldn't have believed it. But, um, but you can find them now. You can find them in the catalogs. Um, and you can find them in the good nurseries too. So they're, And they're not so expensive anymore for some reason. You know what happened? Baby boomers started gardening. That's what happened. Um, when I first started gardening, the baby boomers were still working. They didn't have time to garden. And then they decided they were going to garden and everything that you could never see before all of a sudden became available because there was a huge market for it. So they started, um, started stocking them. So they shouldn't be hard to find these days. Uh, you will find ones that have got a canvas. This piece is canvas instead. <coughs> I wouldn't recommend that for roses. For things that don't have prickles and thorns, they'd be fine, but not for roses. You need the leather. 
Excuse me. Uh, I another have question. question. Can you tell us the make and model of your backpack sprayer? Ah. Uh, no, not offhand, I can't. Um, I've, they're easy to find locally. Um, the one I have is, is actually, is, I, I, it's, it's broken right now. It's worn out. So I actually actually have to get a new one because all of the, over time, the, the rubber pieces, you know, just fade away. So <clears throat> the last time I, I filled it and I had it on my back and I was walking towards the roses and I couldn't understand why my pants were wet. Well, the, the, the seal had broken at the bottom and it was just pouring down the back of my legs. So that was it, I was done. But I can't remember what, what it is, but they're easy to find. Um, and it, the one I have is a four, what had it was a four gallon one, but I never filled it more than three gallons. You have no idea how heavy three gallons of spray is on your back. And what I used to do when it was full, I'd have to stick it on the, the tail of a, of, a back, of a truck so that I could back up and get it onto my shoulders because I could not lift it up and get it over my shoulders. Um, but um, I don't um, I don't have one anymore at the moment and I'm just using a, a two gallon hand sprayer that I just um, don't put on my back. But there are all kinds of different ones. You go down to um, your local fruit growers or you know any one of those places and, and probably that I've never really looked to see if the, 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 the Big stores have them, um, but they certainly the nurseries would have them. But um, I can't tell, I can't remember what the name is, but it's a common one. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Yeah, we have another question about how do you prune carpet roses? Most everything is spindly. Do you just try well, to shape? Yeah, but I, I mentioned that. And, uh, but ground cover roses is the same as, you know, carpet roses are ground cover roses. And I said you have to. Because they keep sending out those long canes, if you want to make it bushier, you cut the canes back. But you also, as the canes grow, they're growing up through the middle, you're going to have dead canes underneath once they don't get enough light because the other canes are growing on top of them, they're going to die. So you, if you want to keep it looking nice, you've got to go in there and prune out those dead canes. Um, and then you can just leave the remaining canes if you want it long. Um, but eventually the canes are going to get so thin, they won't be able to hold the rose. But it, since it's lying on the ground, I guess it doesn't matter. But um, you need to clean up your dead leaves and cut out the dead canes, like I said. Um, thin the remaining canes if they're just too bushy and you don't want them that bushy. And, um, and shorten the canes to promote bushiness if you want them bushier. If you want them long, just leave the canes alone. Does that answer your question? I think so. Can you go over again where to cut the canes above the bud or or above a leaf scar? Above a leaf scar, yes. Above a leaf scar or a bud, yes. And you'll be able to see the bud if if it's really if you live in a cold climate, the bud might be just a little red spot, but it's right above the leaf scar. So you cut at that forty-five degree angle with the top of the angle above the above the bud by about half an inch. Another one is I trimmed my roses down to the bottom thinking that was the correct way but before this class. What can I do now to ensure that they grow healthy? You've got to wait for them to grow first if you cut them all the way down. Um, then you'll have to wait for new canes um, and then you prune them the way I've showed you today to prune them after they've grown. Um, if you see green growth in the spring, then you can fertilize, uh, but don't overdo it. Um, they're awfully hard to kill. Um, if you get a bad disease like we got in our roses, in our rose garden a, a few years ago, and, and it took us a long time to figure out what it was because it was not a common disease. Um, actually, it was a bacteria. But uh, hot, roses are difficult to kill so long as you don't drown them. So chances are it will come back. The only thing you need to be concerned about is you might get rootstock instead of the, uh, instead of the um the actual rose that you planted, um, depending on how far down you cut it. If you cut off the the, um, uh, the, the, the graft, you know, the, the big lump at the bottom, if you cut that off, then you're only going to get rootstock. So you might just as well dig it up and throw it away and plant any rose. Don't plant it in the same hole though. You don't want to plant a rose in the same hole where you previously had a rose. There's something called old rose, whatever. They don't really know, but it it doesn't work well. You can't just take out a rose and put another one in the same place. It doesn't work. 
during the growing season, when a rose dies, dies, do you deadhead just the bloom and leave the stem until it's time to prune the bush? If the rose has died, I don't yeah, understand it, the question. Yeah, that was the question. If a if, rose dies, do, do you deadhead just the bloom and leave the stem? If it's dead, it's dead. I mean, you can tell if a rose is dead when you cut it, cut it back. And if, if there's no green in the center or white in the center, the cane is dead. So you take it out. If there's only one cane, yes, you still would take it out in the growing season. Um, yes, because it's, it's died for a reason. And uh, if there's a disease in it, you want to get it out of there and keep the rose clean. But if the whole rose is died, cut it down and dig it out. Then another question. We purchased our home four years ago, have 33 rose bushes. The first year I did not know what I was doing and hard pruned them all. I had great results. Mm -hmm. First year I had hundreds of rose, roses, all very beautiful and they bloomed several times during the season. Since then, my red roses only bloom once and then they're done. Yellow roses bloom several times, but they aren't very pretty. Any suggestions? Um, if the red rose only did the, my, my first art question would be when you first had the roses, the first year you had the roses, did the red rose bloom more than once during that year? Or did you not prune it at all and you only got one bloom? If you only got one bloom, that means it's a heritage rose, which means if you're going to prune it, you prune it right after that bloom because it's only going to bloom once a year. If you pruned it in the wintertime, you lost that year's bloom, which was why it wouldn't bloom the next year. The yellow rose, um, you will get much better blooms if you prune. You're stimulating new growth. You're taking out old um, ineffective growth, which is taking nutrient from the plant, which you want to put into the good canes. So um, pruning is, is, if you don't prune a rose, you're gonna have, it's gonna, it's gonna get weaker over time because roses grow very quickly. So they'll wear themselves out if you don't prune them. So you need to prune off anything that's unproductive and do it in the winter time. Um, and then of course you need to fertilize a little bit. Remember green growth um, is stimulated by nitrogen and there is some nitrogen in the air. But um, if we get a really wet winter, Nitrogen is water soluble and many times if it's a really hard wet winter, most of the nitrogen that was in the soil has gone so far down with the water that the rose is not able to reach it because the shallow, the roots are fairly shallow. So you could give it some fertilizer, but do not over fertilize with nitrogen because nitrogen is for green growth. And if you fertilize with nitrogen, you'll get lots of green growth and no blossoms. So go really easy on the fertilizer and fertilize when you start seeing green growth, um, preferably with, um, with a slow release fertilizer um, and, and just be careful. And if, if the rose is doing better in the year and it looks fine, don't, don't fertilize it just because the, the package says fertilize five times a year. Don't, if it looks good, leave it alone. My roses and my house and, and at the garden get fertilized in the spring. And often they don't get fertilized again until about um, August. And that is to promote the fall bloom. But I, I'm not one of these people that goes out and feeds my roses every week or, or every month even. Um, if they don't need it, don't feed them. Okay, another, qu mm -hmm. yeah, another question is, can you plant roses in planter boxes? Absolutely, so long as they're big. I've got four roses in very large planters. Um, um, and they are full size roses, um, and they're, they'll do, but they're like, they're like barrels, like half barrels. Um, most plants will be constricted by the amount of space that you give them to grow. So if you put a rose in a small pot, it's going to stay a small, small rose, but it's, it's going to break out of the pot because they are fairly vigorous growers. So you need to, you need to get a good size pot and get some depth. Don't do shallow pots. Uh, give them some depth. You need you need something to take the weight of the rose, because once it grows up, it's going to be heavy, and you don't want you don't want it toppling over because your pot is too small. But yes, they can be grown in containers. And if you look carefully, um, you would pick a rose that's, that's naturally a smaller rose. And if you look on the descriptions of the roses from a good grower, 
they will tell you what size that rose is going to be when it's mature. Now that's a, that's a guess, but it gives you an idea of how big the rose is going to get. So if the rose is, if you're going to plant um, Mr. Lincoln, which is a, a hybrid tea, a red hybrid tea, that's a six foot tall rose. Don't put it in a pot unless it's going to be a really big pot. You want something that's about three feet tall. Okay. And also, can you graft onto a rose if you cut below the original rootstock? Can you graft? Can you? That is, I've done grafting on rootstock, but what the rose growers normally do is they grow the rootstock as a plant. So they grow them up as a rose, and then they graft uh, 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 the, uh, on the bottom cane of the rootstock and start from there. And, and what they're doing is that it's a, it's a, it's a leaf bud. They, they bud them. They don't do a split graft. It's a bud graft. Um, but you do it from, from the cane. You grow up, like I say, you grow up the rootstock first, and then you graft off of the, off of the, the main stem. So not on the root, you don't graft on the root. Okay. So, yes, you can graft on them, but um, you got to know what you're doing. <clears throat> so do you mm. recommend a certain kind of fertilizer? Um, there's all kinds. Um, there's, there's organic, there's non-organic. I go down to the local um, uh, farmer's place and I buy a 50 pound bag of 15, 15, 15 and I throw it out on everything, but I'm not an organic grower. I am for my vegetables, but not for my flowers. Um, and I have huh, I have a very crowded yard. Um, I believe in cottage gardening, so I don't like to see um, bare dirt in the summertime, except for my vegetable garden. So um, I just, I, I can't get in there and sprinkle a little bit around everything. So I just throw it out uh, and then water it in. Um, but it's but it's a it's a chemical fertilizer. It's not an organic fertilizer. There are lots of fertilizers, but you don't want one. You have to remember that, that there's three main numbers on the fertilizer, and the first number is nitrogen. The second number is phosphorus. The third number is potassium. Uh, nitrogen is for green growth, so do not get one with a high nitrogen. Um, the phosphorus and the potassium are for roots and bloom, um, but the nitrogen is for high 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 um high green growth so you'll get lush green growth and the more remember the more fertilizer you put on particularly if it's nitrogen you're going to get very lush growth and just guess what aphids like they love nice lush growth and you're not growing your rose for lush growth you're growing it for blooms so you don't want to overfeed it with nitrogen again because it's going to give you the wrong thing so you have a choice. There's lots of fertilizers that you can use. There's lots of organic fertilizers. Many of the organic fertilizers give you one part of the three. So you need to read the, the container um, and it will tell you, it, it will give you the numbers and, and it will tell you if you've got any micronutrients in there too, which you might need or you might prefer to have. So um, it's a matter of choice, but there are plenty out there. But I wouldn't yeah, go, go urea or something, or even, uh, um, yeah, not urea is like 40, 42% nitrogen. That's huge. And when they give you those numbers, those are numbers of the percentage of that, of that um, um, portion that by weight in the bag. So you can tell if it's 20, 20, 20, it's 20%, 20%, and 20%. And some of the materials are inert. They're, they're just used for spreaders, but... Uh, if, it's, if it says 20% nitrogen, it means 20% by weight of the bag is nitrogen, okay? Yeah, but so, uh, someone was curious, what's your favorite kind of rose and why? Ah, oh, I love the English roses, the David Austin roses. They are spectacular, but they do not behave themselves. Um, when you prune them, and you prune them to where you think you want the growth to go, chances are it's going to be somewhere that you certainly didn't anticipate it. Um, they smell wonderful, they look gorgeous, and they make terrible cut flowers. There are very few of the English roses. In fact, if you go to the, the most obvious uh, catalog, which of course is the David Austin catalog, um, they will list the roses for you that are good for cutting. Most of them are not. They're grown for in the field, not for cut roses. So if you want them for cut roses, you want something that's going to be a, have a nice long cane. Um, you know, 
I don't have a favorite. I mean, I love them all. Um, well, no, not, that's not true. I'm not too keen on purple roses, but the first purple roses that came out were awful. So I was kind of biased from the start. And now in our garden, those of you who can come out to see our rose garden, it should be in full bloom by May, um, assuming we're open. And um, we, have the, we have the garden divided up by color. And there is a section of purple roses, lavenders and purples and pinky purples and that kind of stuff, because we divided them by color. So people can, if they're looking for a red rose, they can go take a look at our red rose section. Um, so I don't really have a favorite. Um, I, I, I really, every time I think that's my favorite, then I see one that I like just as well or I like better. So I can't really say. Uh, on that same note, what is an English rose? The English roses are, um, are, are new hybrids. They hybridized modern roses with old roses. By the old roses, I mean the antique roses because they had beautiful colors, many, many, many petals, many of them, and wonderful perfume, and they were much more disease resistant. So they hybridized them with modern, more modern roses because they got more colors. Um, uh, but they are, they're not like a hybrid tea. They are shrub roses and they, they are pretty vigorous. Um, and if you're living in, if you're living in a place like San Francisco where you don't get a lot of heat, um, you probably don't want to grow the English roses because when you don't have a lot of heat and you have a lot of petals, they, they, the, the, um, the blossom doesn't open out properly because there's not, not enough heat. In fact, when you're buying a rose, if you live in somewhere like San Francisco, you want 25 petals or so. If you're living where I live in the heat, you want at least 35 petals because the, the, the ones with less petals will open up very quickly and they'll be done in a day in our heat. But if you live in a cooler climate, you don't want as many petals because they won't open properly. properly. The uh, English roses, if, if you are aware, if your grandma had roses that she called cabbage roses, because they had so many petals on them. That's the kind of rose you get. They, are, they have intense blue, um, uh, color, not colors. They have, they have deli more delicate colors, um, but they have intense fragrance, most of them. And like I say, they are very unruly. They're very unruly. We do have a section of English roses in our garden, uh, what we call English roses, um, but many of them, of course, are, are hybrids taking some of the old French roses and, you know, and, many old varieties and hybridizing them across. Um, and it was David Austin who was the first one that did this on a, a large scale. So that's why his are the most famous. Another question is, how do you remove the dead blooms on a bush? Okay, that's easy. Um, if you just want to clean up the bush and you're not worried about stimulating new growth right now, you can just pick them off just like that. But if if you're if you're deadheading to get rebloom, you go down to the to the first and you will look on a rose and you will see that the roses have um, multiple clusters of leaves, so they have leaflets, okay, um, and there are there is a, a stem with three leaflets on a on a stem, and there's a stem with five leaflets on a stem. You want to cut down to a five leaflet stem. So the, the little stems are sticking out from the rose. Okay, this one's got three on it. This one's got five on it. You want to go down to the five um, and cut just above that five, remembering you want to cut it in the direction that you want the new growth to go because it will grow some new growth and then it will grow a new blossom. So that's what you want to do. So you do that all throughout the growing season. You cut down to a five leaflet leaf. You have to take into consideration, however, some of the English roses, they are all five leaflets. So then you, you go down to where, remember what I said when I was pruning, eventually if the, if the canes are too thin, they can't handle the weight of the rose. And so it's gonna go like this. So you, want, you don't wanna cut, if you've got very thin cane, you cut down, cut that cane out and cut to a thicker cane uh, while you're deadheading to keep the roses so that they will bloom prettily for you. But you deadheading, you do have to cut. You do have to cut. But you can just pick off blossoms, but you won't get the stimulation. Now, if you've if you've got an old rose, it's only going to bloom once a year. Um, maybe for some of them, you just want to pick them off. If you just want to do a quick cleanup, and then you can come back and prune it back later. 
And what for and how does one use bone meal to fertilize roses? Bone meal is, is phosphorus. Um, and bone meal would be a good thing to put in the hole when you're planting. Um, bone meal is not water soluble, so putting it on the top of the soil won't do any good, although the raccoons will love you. And so will the, um, uh, what's the other ones? The ones with the stripes down their backs. Um, they like the smell of bone meal because they think there's something there. Um, but normally bone meal is, is, goes down in the soil, not on the surface. And it's also, very good. It's very good. It's a natural fertilizer, but, it's, but it, is, it is phosphorus. It's not, it's not nitrogen. Can you use the dried rose buds for making tea to drink? Or is there a special type of rose for making tea? Well, first of all, you have to make darn sure you haven't sprayed it with anything. Um, I would say if the rose is heavily perfumed, it would probably make a good tea. If it's not heavily perfumed, I'm not sure if it would make a good tea because, you know, the taste of something has got a lot to do with the smell because, you know, it's going to go past your nose before it goes into your mouth. But you have to make darn sure that, um, that you haven't, you haven't sprayed it. The other thing is, I think most teas, let's see, are they made out of rose tea? Well, might be made out of the hips more than the, um, more than the petals. I just don't know. I've, I don't think I've ever had rose tea. I have dried roses and used them in potpourri. You know, if you get the little ones like Cecile Bruner has a little tiny pink rose on it. And the rose buds are perfect dried. If you dry them carefully, you have to make sure because they're buds that they're dried all the way through. And then you can mix them into your own homemade potpourri and they look so pretty and they have some perfume. But using them for tea, um, I'm not sure. I've never made it from the petals. Can you start a rose from clippings? Yes, you can. Um, this is what you would do. You've taken off a cane. When you take off your canes, if you're going to use them, well, Usually, if I'm going to make cuttings from, from a rose, and remember, if it's a patented rose, you're not supposed to propagate from a patented rose. If it's a non-patented rose, if it's been around for a long time, like peace, for instance, the patent is run out, you're okay to propagate it. But you can't propagate a patented rose. You've cut off your cane. So you're going to take um, two buds down and two buds up. This is a bud here. This is a bud here, bud here bud here. So you're going to cut the bottom off just below the bottom bud, which is here. And you're going to bury it, this bud and this bud. So you're going to bury it to here. And you're going to have two buds up. And you cut the top bud at a 45 degree angle, just above the bud. And that's because you don't want any water to settle on that top there. Uh, so you've buried these in soil. And you put these up and you, tape, you tap them in, you can do it in a gown pot or you can do it in the soil right beside your rose. Remember, if you're going to hybridize, if you're going to grow more than one rose or more than one variety of rose, keep them separate because once they're cut off, you don't know what they are. So you wanna be able to label them or you're gonna to have to wait until they bloom to figure out what they are if they get mixed up. But they're, they're fairly easy to start and you can just, when you feed your fertilize your other roses, fertilize them at the same time, they may bloom the first year. If it does, cut off the bloom. I know it's hard to do, but cut it off when it, when it sets up a bud. And within a couple of years, you can put it in the ground and start growing it. And then you will have an own root rose. It will not be a grafted rose. It will be growing on its own roots. Okay. Any more qu any questions on that? Uh, yes, I, so. I see a question there. Yes, you do use rooting hormone. Uh, rooting, hormone. rooting hormone is a, there's a liquid form or a powder form, which is often used for hardwood plants to get them started. And when, you've, um, when you cut this, the other thing you want to do is to lay it in some, chlorinic, some, some chlorinated water, 1% um, chlorine to water, and lay them down and soak them in it for a few minutes because there are going to be... Um, fungus uh, fungus on the cane you know there's going to be the starts of the fungus you want to get rid of that so you you've got a wet cane so you take some of your rooting hormone and you dip the bottom of the cane in the rooting hormone and you don't need a lot just a little bit 
and it's going to help stimulate the roots to grow. So yes, you would use rooting hormone. If you have roses with six or seven leafets, is that a sucker cane? Not necessarily. Um, I can't answer that definitively. Not necessarily. Most of the sucker canes are not particularly heavily leafed. I mean, they're, they're strong leaves, but they're not very special. It may be just a variety of rose that's got lots of leaves. Okay, another question is, you said to cut in the direction that you want the new growth to go. That's right. But what does that mean? The high point of your cut on the side of a five leaf stem? Um, let's see. We're talking about when you're when you're deadheading. Okay, so yeah, you're gonna cut. You're gonna have a bud here. You've got a five leaf stem, so you're gonna grow. You're gonna plant. You're gonna grow just above the five leaf stem. If yeah, you would you would cut it. The, when you can tell which way the bud is facing. You have to to to. You see, the bud is facing this way. It's gonna grow this way. A bud that's on the other side is going to grow that way. And so you go to a, where you want the bud to be on which side of the cane, and that's where you cut, just above the five leaf growth. And the new cane is going to come out from that growth, and that's what's going to bloom. So it's not just going to be a little blossom stem that comes out, it's going to be a new cane. Okay, good. And um, another question What's the brand of your? gloves Puma Pumi I don't know it's half wash half I don't know can you see that I don't think there's a label inside yes there is it just says the gauntlet and guess where it's made China and this is a lady's small to medium. And they're a little large on me, but I usually can't find gloves small enough for me anyway. So I have to do the best I can. But um, I, I, you know, they're, they're kind of generic rose gloves. You know, they're not hard to find anymore. I think if you go to a large nursery and I, we don't like to name nurseries, so I'm not going to name one, but there are, you know, a good, a good cl high class nursery, you're going to find them. <coughs> That's all the questions that are in the chat room. Okay. Do you have anything else you, you would like to talk about? Um, not really. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions to do with growing roses, not just necessarily pruning them, but um, if everybody's done, um, I can't think of anything that I've forgotten. I hope I haven't forgotten anything, but anything's possible. I'm an old lady, so, you know. Um, I'm, I'm glad you joined me today and I hope you learned um, that rosing, rose pruning is not necessarily a horrific thing. I mean, you could get kind of stick it up, but it's not so scary once you go through the system that I, I'll go through that system with you just one more time. Okay, you're gonna cut off the top, then you're gonna remove dead and diseased wood. Um, you're gonna remove um, any, any um, root stock all the way down as far as you can and if you can dig down a little bit actually with rootstock if you can do it though you, often you can't um if you can pull it off like you cut it down to about knee high and if you can grab it and pull it off at the base all the way down there's a good chance you'll take out any bud that might be on it if you cut them down they're going to come back if there's any bud left on it it's going to grow back so it's a constant thing um, so anyway, you take you take those off. Um, you open the center for good air circulation. Um, you're going to tuck out the dead and diseased canes, the crossing and the weak canes, the little skinny canes, um, and shorten the remaining healthy canes, and then defoliate any remaining leaves that are on the canes that are, are old leaves. Okay. So that should make it fairly simple for them. You don't have to make any any decisions until you come to the remaining canes after you've taken out all the, all the old stuff and the broken stuff and the skinny stuff and the cross stuff, so. Okay, we have two quick questions. Mm -hmm. Do you disinfect your tools between your roses? Between no, your I don't. Um, 
if you're really picky, I guess you can. Um, if I had bad disease on my roses, I would. Um, I, would dis I would disinfect them between every cut, but I might disinfect them from one rose to another. Um, the only problem with disinfecting your roses, I haven't found a disinfectant that isn't gonna, disinfecting your tools, sorry. I haven't found a disinfectant that won't corrode your, your tools over time. Um, and basically what I use, if I'm gonna use one at all, I just use a spray disinfectant. You know, like, you know, you can buy the sprays and I just want use one of those. Um, but then when you come, when you're finished, you wanna wash those tools and dry them to get that disinfectant off them and then put them away in a dry place and make sure they're lubricated. And, and you make, make sure that you sharpen your tools before you stop, before you start your pruning, because there's nothing worse than tools that are not sharp because they will tear the canes and that get stuck because they're not well lubricated, they're lubricated at the, at, the, um, at the spring, at the joint. So um, make sure they're nice and sharp. And there's, you can buy sharpeners in lots of places. So there's lots of ways to sharpen them, but make sure they're sharp. Uh, we've got two more questions. How much water for roses? Two inches a week. Um, so basically you're gonna water, first of all, you water <coughs> early in the morning because you don't want the roses to go to bed wet. That's when you get most diseases. You want the leaves to be dry before the sun goes down. Um, and you don't really wanna water them in the heat. Well, I'm not, I shouldn't say that I've often sprayed overhead my plants in the, when it's really hot outside just to create some some moisture in the air but <clears throat> but you don't want the, the leaves to be wet when the sun goes down um slow deep water is the best uh, if you use a soaker hose or you use um drip irrigation they are fairly shallow rooted but if you only water very shallowly and people make a lot of mistakes they um uh, they have a landscaper come in and sets up their landscaping for them and they never change the sprinkler system. And you have to understand that if you need one dripper for a baby rose, you need six for a mature rose. And putting it at the, at the, at the center of the rose right down where it was planted isn't doing you any good because the roots grow out and where you want the water is at the edge of the roots. So you have to move your system as your plants grow. Um, so what I do is I water, it depends, two to three times a week, and I let the water run until I've got, I know I've got moisture a, a good six inches down in the soil. But you don't want it soggy, you don't want to be watering every day. Shallowly every day is not the way to go. You're gonna, that's not good for any of your plants. You want those roots to go down and they won't go down if there's no water down there. If the water is always on the surface, the roots are always gonna be on the surface. And so they're much more subject to damage on the surface. Okay. And in El Dorado Hills, is now a good time to prune? Um, wait another week. Okay. And one last question. For the fertilizer, I thought you said 15, 15, 15. The PDF that was listed here mentions that 18, 6, 12 is a good mix for roses. Which should we get? Well, you might use the 18 for the first food, but that, that 18, that's 18% 18 nitrogen. Um, and I wouldn't want to keep feeding that all year. Um, you don't want a lot, of, a lot of green growth. You don't want lush green growth every year. You want to promote, promote bloom. And that 18% that nitrogen every time is just too high. And by the way, if you're doing organic fertilizers, you won't find one that's 18%. They're much lower numbers. <clears throat> okay, I think that's it. I'd like to thank Eve and all the participants for coming to class today. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have fun pruning your roses.